Right, so it's recording now. Uh, great. Uh, thank you so much for attending the last um, event of Dr. Ross Mouse Not On Tour. Um, I'm pretty exhausted because this is event nine of nine. Um, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. In fact, the, the last event was supposed to be on Monday, but I realized I was only um, advertising to people already on my mailing list um, and on Twitter and such. So I thought I'd put a notice on the homepage. Um, just, um, sorry, let me get the... Um, just some, uh, to say that if you've got particular questions uh, you want to ask, um, if it's specific to what I'm currently doing in the demo, then that's absolutely fine. If you've got more general questions, like let's just say I'm, I don't know, demoing how to set up a class and you want to ask a question about uh, what exam boards I'm going to provide for in the future, then if you could save those questions to the end, um, it's just so people don't get too distracted um, by the chat thread. But if you have a specific question about what we're asking and what I'm currently doing, then that's absolutely fine. Uh, to answer. I'll try and answer as I um, go along in the uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to try and spend much as time as possible actually doing some demos. So I'm going to very quickly rattle through these initial slides just to introduce um, Dr. Frost Mass. And I'd also note that I'm going to be providing um, a recording tonight or tomorrow morning at the latest um, with a recording of this particular event. But I've recorded all of them so you can watch whatever one you want, including the advanced events um, that I've been doing over the past weeks as well. So what's Dr. Ross Maths? If you're not familiar at all with um, what it is, it's kind of threefold. So it's initially like a place for me to put um, all my teaching resources. So you might be familiar with, for example, particularly A-level resources are very popular, but I've also got resources for um, uh, GCC and Key Stage 3 and such, uh, and they've been very popular, about 7.2 million downloads now. Um, and uh, teaching videos is something I started a few years ago, sort of bought some equipment, and um, that's been, uh, yeah, interesting because, uh, le interesting learning curve because I hadn't sort of made videos before, but they're, they're proving quite popular. And then about uh, three years ago is when I launched the online platform where students can sort of practice independently questions and teachers can set work and master work. And that's what most of the presentation is going to be on today, uh, explaining how you can use that uh, in your school. So here's a kind of overview of the site structure. And this is like changed literally within the last few months with the launch of the key skills platform. So let me try and elucidate. Um, you've got the downloadable resources, all the slides obviously and such, uh, and worksheets for classroom use. There's also a computer science platform, which not many people know about. So um, this is the first year I was teaching uh, computer science for GCSE. We do the OCR syllabus and there's slides on pretty much the whole syllabus there now. Uh, and also students can log in and they, there's little mini coding tasks they can do and they all sort of check their code and say whether it works and it saves their code on their DFM account, which is quite cool. So that's sort of in its infancy, um, but there is something there which I've been using this year with my own students. You've also got a bunch of utilities. There will be more in the future, but at the moment the big thing is the DFM whiteboard. Um, I've been doing lots of development work on that. Um, in the last few months, and I've tried to integrate it into other parts of the platform. For example, uh, when students are answering questions, they can provide working uh, and things like that, and making it easier to annotate uh, exam questions. And then you've obviously got the questions. So basically the questions are kind of split into two different types. You've got the sort of exam questions, you like the sort of fixed question database, about 41,000 questions, and they're from a variety of different exam boards. I have licenses with Edexcel, AQA, OCR, EDUCAS, that's a Welsh exam board, uh, the UK Mathematics Trust. Um, and I'm currently in talks with the CCEA, uh, that's uh, a, an exam board in Northern Ireland. Um, and some, exam, some licenses are more restricted than others. So Edexcel just let me use whatever. Um, AQA, I'm only allowed to use that older stuff, but um, I have recently been in, uh, in conversations with Andrew Taylor, um, head of maths at AQA, and there is a possibility that actually I'll be able to use uh, more questions in the future. And he says I'm at the top of his priority list, so um, that, that's quite good news. Um, so the, the way the topic structure works for that is slightly broader. Um, so there might be, for example, uh, just one topic on, um, I don't know, like, you know, direct and indirect proportion where you have to find the constant proportionality, but there's like one skill in that and all the exam questions on that. Um, whereas with the key skills platform, that would then be um, much more fine grain. So you would have, for example, direct proportion, direct proportion when there's a power involved, direct proportion when there's a root involved, etc., and much more broken down into individual types of questions rather than a broader topic as such. So that's the new thing, which was only launched a few weeks ago, 
and um, it's intended for students to do kind of more repetitive practice at very specific kinds of questions because I, I kind of feel that's what was lacking from DFM in the past. Um, and with these, you've got sure to work solution videos, um, and that's what I'm, I'm going to be producing over the summer holiday because there's only three of them at the moment. Um, but I'm hoping to produce a thousand by September. So I've certainly got uh, my work cut out. Someone's asking about um, international baccalaureate. Um, they're notoriously strict with granting licenses. I've tried to contact them twice. I didn't even get so much to reply. Um, so I'll, I'll work on that, but I would love to be able to use questions from them, but they're, they're not budging at all or even contacting me. Um, and those, the key skills questions, by the way, are randomly generated. So we have algorithms that sort of generate questions from those very specific types. And I'll be able to show you that later. Uh, and then it's also sort of a numeracy thing. It's certainly not times table rock stars. He does that much better than I do. Um, but there is something there for students to practice their times and divide the tables, which is quite nice. Uh, there's analytics in terms of analyzing student performance, exporting reports, etc. And then with those questions, like the fixed questions, the exam questions and the key skill questions, you can either set these to students, and I'll show you how to do that, either as a homework or the formal assessment, I'll explain the difference. Uh, and students can independently practice themselves. So a big emphasis of the site is for students to be able to um, be independent learners as well. You can also then um, create a worksheet. So you can do that with exam questions at the moment, and there's a nice little interface where you can choose the questions to put together, um, and then, uh, which I'll show you, and you can then output it to Word, uh, which contains the mark scheme, which is pretty awesome. Um, so it's a bit like exam wizard in that respect. Or you can set that collection of um, questions to uh, students as well. Now I will literally within the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna be doing that for key skills because at the moment the key skills questions are random, um, but you could, for example, then generate a fixed set of questions of key skills. So you can then make sure you set the same questions to every student. So that, that's coming literally within the next few weeks. That's the next on my to-do list. And then you've also got to do something called DFM Lives. So it's a bit like um, Kahoot's if you've used that before, but it's much more math specific. So it's not multiple choice unless it's specifically a multiple choice question and students actually have to input actual answers uh, for that rather than just kind of guessing from uh, four options. Uh, just a bit about me, that picture was I think took two weeks ago. Um, so I'm secretly a computer scientist masquerading as a, a mathematician. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at math, but computer science is my background. Uh, so I did an undergraduate four year degree at Oxford um, and then um, a PhD after that in computational linguistics, which is how we use statistics in various tasks in uh, language processing and things like that. And, and so I did a bit of machine learning as well. Uh, and I had a stint in between um, in the investment banking world, absolutely hated it. It was just about sort of helping an institution which already had a very large amount of money um, make more money. Um, and it was just pretty soul destroying. So after about a year there, I sort of emailed my old project supervisor and said, um, is there any kind of PhD opportunities in the horizon? He said, yes, uh, the, the deadline's midnight. Um, and uh, <laughs> I resigned a week later. So um, that's how that happened. And in terms of um, getting into teaching, so I did a lot of teaching with departments. I had some visiting students from uh, Princeton, for example, I was looking after, and I did a lot of uh, departmental teaching as well. And I really loved that. So I thought maybe I should, uh, I've got to think of what I'm going to do after my uh, PhD finishes. Do I want to stay in academia or do I try teaching? So I spent a week um, at uh, the school I'm teaching at the moment um, saying, could I teach some lessons? They said, absolutely, come here. And um, the rest is history. And I've been at that school um, ever since. Uh, I, but what's not very known about me is I failed 11 plus um, and the school I subsequently went to, which is a kind of bog standard comprehensive, um, I think it was 32% A star to C the year before me uh, for GCC, which is pretty low. And um, it, the Ofsted report said um, it's pupils from a lower than average social background. Um, so I come from relatively humble uh, beginnings um, and, and didn't have many sort of educational opportunities. I, I was very independent in sort of teaching myself. Um, and, and that's partly what motivated um, Dr. Ross Maths being kept free. So um, in maths, for example, like I was very bright at maths and I was just given a sort of blank exercise book and the teacher said, you don't have to take part in lessons, just do what you like, except I was never provided with any resources or any like even just a maths challenge paper would have been nice, um, but I wasn't given anything. Uh, and it sort of makes me think that it's kind of sad that uh, other schools, if students don't have that kind of support, 
um, and they weren't quite as independent as me, that they're just not going to have that love for mathematics that, that I did. Um, and at the opposite end of the ability spectrum, like if there's students who struggle with maths, but, but don't have necessarily good maths teaching at their school or don't have access to good resources, um, I just wanna make sure that, that DFM is available to all regardless of income and background. I just find it quite sad when you have sort of some of these online platforms that's charging thousands of pounds to schools and, and they can't afford it or, or they even have it for a few years and just I've had a lot of schools come to me because they haven't been able to afford the subscription fees for other sites I'm not going to say what um, and I'm very much going to stay free uh, forever so don't worry about that and I've been teaching uh, for eight years. And um, it's sort of a two-man team. So I'm assisted by uh, Mr. Dupont Pinon. Uh, he is a full-time teacher and uh, he's in charge of the question database and I only discovered two months ago that he's like a programmer. So he's actually coding a lot of the individual uh, um, logic for the key skills on the new platform. Um, and he's doing an absolutely brilliant job. I, um, I'm going to try and persuade him to go part-time eventually so he can work more on DFM, just as I'm attempting to go part-time uh, after next academic year. Um, this is my flex size. That's with the lovely Anita Rani um, on the National Teaching Awards. And uh, I should probably grab the trophy. Here it is, it's very heavy. Um, there we go, you can, you can see that. Um, I can't see myself anymore, where is it? Yeah, there I am, there we go. It's ridiculously heavy, so I wouldn't want to drop this. Hello, cat, I'm not gonna drop this on you. Get out of the way. Um, let's admit Chris. And then more recently, I've been uh, in the, uh, the top 50 for the um, Global Teacher Prize. And uh, I will find out very soon if I'm in the top 10. So fingers crossed with that. That's me in the eye. I was also in the, the Evening Standard. And that's me. The one place I didn't expect to get a, a teaching gig is on a right-wing radio show. So I was asked to um, teach Mike Graham about um, Pythagoras theorem. And then um, the week after, because they got so many calls in to say, oh, can we get this guy back? Um, I was asked to explain about prime numbers. So um, there, there's a, a sort of media page on my site where you can view those videos. Um, site stats, I'm not gonna waste your time with this, but um, yeah, 10,000 page views in one year. That's when I started teaching. I get then about five minutes nowadays. Um, and it's been steady increasing. Um, I try to do like um, investigate um, I think I, I logged the Y values there and um, worked out the product moment correlation coefficient. It was about 0.98, so very strong. Um, and then 59 million page views this year. Now, this is projected, but so 410 million for this year. Now, that, that might seem far-fetched, but I should point out I estimated that 59 million figure this time last year, and I was only 1% out despite predicting it in May. Um, so there's no reason why I shouldn't reach that figure because there's been a exponential explosion uh, in usage and and obviously the lockdown has partly contributed to that um you, you wouldn't believe the carnage when the lockdown started and i had three times as many uh page views as i would on a typical day and i had to move server i then over the Easter holiday had to literally recode everything um to sort of cope with those sort of the sort of 1.2 million page views a day um in terms of resource downloads so these are slides i've made um yeah, 7.12 million as of this morning, I think. So uh, very popular resources. Uh, and you think like the, num the millions of lessons they've been used in, that, that's quite cool to know that they're being used so widely. And in terms of questions answered on the platform, um, this has been increasing very rapidly. And then I had to add this figure just literally five minutes before this meeting started. Like just in the month, like you got another uh, 4 million questions answered. So it's going up very rapidly at the moment and being uh, very well utilized the online platform. And about six and a half thousand schools have at least one registered user. So someone's registered on the site and logged in at some point. Um, so that varies massively. I, I would say there's basically just over 3,000 schools where there's actually been proper activity on the site in terms of answering questions. And that might just be a couple of students or it might be like the whole school using it for all their homeworks and such. So, so it varies massively. Um, I think Tiffin School is... Um, that's an art logo. Um, somewhere around here, I did find it the other day, but I've, I think uh, I've lost it again. Um, and it's been used increasingly internationally as well. So um, England, by far the most popular. Um, these, these are points, total points. Uh, but Malaysia um, and, and United Arab Emirates are in close second. Uh, oh, Egypt is down there. That's probably largely contributed by uh, Michael's school. Um, so thanks for that. Um, but particularly England, Malaysia and UAE are the, the, the biggest using schools of DFM at the moment. Um, 
Not so many in the United States. It's a very crowded market um, and Khan Academy is quite big there um, and their syllabus is quite different as well. So I'll be looking to see how I can expand to the States at some point. Now, GFM 3.0 is the sort of big new thing, um, and it was st I started coding it at the beginning of Easter. Um, and I'm very receptive to feedback, by the way, on, on uh, the site, and I try to, try to implement as many feature requests as I can. But there's some more kind of underlying criticisms of the site, which sort of maybe dissuaded some schools from using it. Um, so one of the criticisms was just the user interface wasn't friendly enough. And... Um, that was largely a function of like so many features being added all over time. I just needed to take a step back and sort of think about how it all fits together. So literally every, every interface is being completely recoded um, and the interface, interface redesigned. Um, and another sort of maybe more fundamental criticism was um, the topic breakdown was more broad. So I was talking about earlier, like the sort of exam questions versus the key skills platform. And like, you might just have a single topic for like, um, proportion problems where you've got to find the constant proportionality. Um, now that's great if a student has already sort of finished a topic and you want, want to practice exam questions on it. Maybe not so good if a student's currently learning a topic and just wants repetitive practice on the kinds of questions they've learned about so far. So that's where the key skills platform has come into play. And, and the feedback from that so far, from those who've used it in the last few weeks has been phenomenal. So um, I think we, we've, we've done a good job of producing that. Um, and also I did a survey not so long ago on what functionality teachers were using. So um, the DFM whiteboard was something that no one was really using at all. I think like 5% of users said, said they'd actually seen it at some point. Um, and I thought it had quite a lot of potential. So I, was, I sort of thought about how could I make this more prominent on the site and use it in a variety of ways. And also just like the increasing traffic I was talking about, like so many users using it. Um, so I had to sort of think about optimizing everything. So that's the sort of like the aims of DFM 3.0, the sort of newer version of it. Um, and how have I addressed these? Well, the first thing is the key skills platform I launched in June. Um, and questions, as I mentioned before, um, are randomly generated on very specific types of questions. So this one is on just um, coordinates in the first quadrant. Um, so they have to, they get coordinates, six, three, and have to pl uh, click where it is, and they get this sort of nice little automatic feedback. Um, so we've got about, I think we're up to now 340, but we're trying to get to 1,000 by September. So I've just employed um, someone to do some, uh, he's a full-time teacher, but I'm paying some money to write some A-level skills for me, the code for that, and he's done a fantastic job of that so far. So I might be able to show you that later. Um, so here's some of the other cool skills. So this is solving a linear equation with the unknown and base size. And look at this. This is a randomly generated question. And look at that feedback, just all those arrows and stuff. That, that's randomly generated um, feedback from the question, which uh, I think is pretty cool, like the tech behind it. Um, this is another one, cumulative frequency graph. So there's two versions. I think there's one where they're given a frequency table, and then there's an easier version where they're given the cumulative frequency table, so they don't have to find the cumulative frequencies. And they have to draw uh, the graph on it, and then it gives them the feedback and sort of explains how they would get the cumulative frequency graph, etc., and how they would plot the points. So this is really cool. And this one's a bit of a joke one in a way. So this is one of the harder skills. You can see at the top, uh, forming the equation uh, using uh, sampling without replacement. So that's where they're given some probability problem. They have to form an equation, a quadratic equation. So I did this to celebrate, um, did you remember the Hannah Sweets problem from about five years ago? And there was sort of a bit of a ruckus because all the students were complaining, oh, we've never seen a question like this before. And all went to social media to complain. And uh, it was even like on the, like the news, like people doing like, they, they would get maths experts on to explain how to do this question to everyone. Like it's just a bit bizarre. So on the, the fifth anniversary of the Hannah Sweets question, I made a, a, an automated, uh, a random Hannah Sweets question generator. And it, um, it randomizes the name, I think the objects, it's sweets, beads or marbles. Uh, it randomizes the colors and then also, um, uh, also randomizes whether it's the total number of objects that's unknown or the specific number of objects that's unknown. Um, and look at this, so I made this one, even though Gaten um, has been doing most of the coding. Um, and this is, this is all like um, automatically generated feedback from this random question. So they could get infinitely many Hannah Sweets questions if they wanted. Um, and note, by the way, that all, the, all these will eventually have like um, a worked example video. Um, so I'll show you an example of those later because I have made a few of those, but, but that's my big holiday day job basically. 
Um, also, I've just replaced like every single interface. So this was the old dashboard and it just, it was, it was horrid, the design. Like, um, there's, it just wasn't very clear how to access the latest homework. There's just so much going on. There were like sub menus and then sub sub menus within that to access certain help. Just not a good interface. And that's been replaced more recently with this nice one. Uh, you still have like the notifications feed here. There's just like a single help button which brings up a video explaining how it's done. You've just got these nice tiles which explain each of the parts of the site. And like, oh, you've got the latest homework key, just click it to go straight to the latest one. And it's just much clearer, I think. And, and the, the, the feedback's very, been very positive. Actually, people know how to use DFM now and, and know about the various bits of functionality in the site where they might not have realized there was a DFM live mode and things like that before. Um, this is like the new progress interface. Again, I've got rid of like the menu on the left there was, and um, it's just much more spacious, more space for data and just a bit clearer to use. And yeah, this questions interface you can see here, that was completely redesigned from the ground up as well. It's also much faster, so everything's much more efficient as well. So you have to, uh, there's less loading time. So, and the whiteboard I mentioned earlier, um, I've, there's loads of ways in which it's used now. So um, when students answer questions, they get this nice little mini whiteboard on the right where they can write some working. And in fact, as a teacher, if you set some work, there is an option to require working, so they have to draw it. And then when you go to view their answers, it will have their written working along with it. And you can see it here. This was a year nine end of year test we did a few weeks ago. And it was a question on like, you know, um, proofs involving consecutive odd numbers, that kind of stuff. Um, so they put in their answer, their algebraic answer. But they've also provided their working. And it meant, for example, with this end of year test that I could give um, award partial marks for questions on the basis of working. Um, so that's a big new thing. Um, and also with the whiteboard, it's just, if you're viewing a question, you can click this nice little annotate button. I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, and then it automatically loads that question within the DFM whiteboard. And um, they, you can then annotate over it in class, which is quite useful. There's a few questions here. Um, can they type their working? Um, there is a text tool. Can you see that text tool the, over there, the little T? Um, they can do that. So they can type on the whiteboard. Now, um, I've also just tried to cater for, um, so would they need a touch screen? Uh, not necessarily, can you use your mouse? The mouse works, uh, or even a trackpad works as well, although I wouldn't want to try and draw in a trackpad. Um, so I'm also just trying to think like, how am I catering for every type of learner? So, um, so in terms of lower priority students, um, for key stage two and three, I think there's particularly a gap on DFM for sort of um, lower ability um, key stage three students. So the key skills system is trying to cater for that. So it literally starts from number bonds and like there's some nice key skills already on there, like sort of subtraction and it, it shows the exact method in the feedback with like the borrowing and things like that, which is pretty cool. Um, and up to all the, all the stuff they'd be expected to do um, in key stage three. Um, and then you've got the main exam database of questions. So there you've got like, I've got all the key stage two and three SATs papers, which is quite nice. And then for the sort of um, more able mathematicians, you've got uh, primary math challenge questions and uh, junior math challenge questions. I've got all the papers back to 1997. Uh, key stage four for GCSE. Uh, again, you've got this new key skill system, like starting from the real basics. And then in terms of exam questions, you've got foundation and high tip questions. And then uh, for the upper ability the students, you've got um, intermediate math challenge questions. And then for key stage five, I say coming soon, but we've actually already made a few um, since a few weeks ago. Um, but you've also got uh, past paper questions. And then for, about up at the, for more able students, you've got um, senior maths challenge questions and the MAT, which is the maths admissions test for uh, Imperial Oxford, etc. So uh, I really am trying to cater for both um, the, the full ability spectrum. And just a few resources for note, and I'm going to be very quick, and then I'll get straight into the demo. Um, these are within the resources menu. Uh, full coverage sheets, you might have come across those, I don't know. But I particularly used them last year for my GCC and A-level revision. Um, and what I've done is I've scoured the last 20 years of exam papers and tried to find, let's say for this one is on laws of indices, I've tried to find an example question for each type. So um, the early questions would be like the basic laws of indices. And these are some of the later ones, like, you know, when you have like, 25 root 5 and you have to write as a power 5 that kind of question um, so really trying to well full coverage cover every sort of type of question um, every kind of eventuality um, 
the students. And in, in, and in fact, I produced these just before the first nine to one paper. And I, I very accurately predicted a number of questions on that paper um, that hadn't been seen in a long while. Um, so yeah, they, those are really useful. They're just downloadable PDFs on my site. I, I think there's actually online versions as well. You can actually search your students, but it's mainly intended as a sort of downloadable PDF. Um, uh, newbie question from the whiteboard. Are there any other ways to communicate real time with learners? Um, it depends what you mean by real time. I'll, I'll try and address that question later. Um, and then you've also got a, like an interactive uh, PowerPoint for all the main calculators. So you've got the, this is the class with here, which I haven't had on hand. Um, I've also got one for the GCC class with a new one and the older Casio calculators. And now it's not an emulator, but you can click all the buttons and it'll explain how to do it, how to use it for certain types of exam questions. Uh, and those are pretty cool. Um, I'm actually, uh, when I have the time, I'm going to try and persuade Casio to send me a free um, graphing, a graphical calculator so I can make a PowerPoint for them. They've asked me a few favors in the past, actually. Um, so if they can send me a calculator, that'd be cool. Um, also, you've got the A-level sliders that you've probably encountered them at some point. In fact, um, uh, Pearson sent one of their publishers to me a couple of years ago to sort of see if they could officiate a sort of relationship of my slides with, with Pearson because they knew that basically I was a de facto default slides for the new um, Edexcel A-level syllabus. So um, they just, they wanted to actually put it in a virtual textbook or something and that sort of fizzled out in the end, but um, it's nice to know. <laughs> Um, there's also some posters. You can print out posters. I've got a few of these in my classroom. And I've made about 15 of these and the various questions I've pondered over the years um, as an either teacher or as a student. So you might, I'm sure you've seen A-level questions or GCC questions where you have to put the, the equation of a straight line in the form AX plus BY plus C equals zero with, with integers. But like why? Why would we want to do that over Y equals MX plus C? Um, so there's some really nice posters that you can print out for your classroom on that kind of stuff. Um, also, now I, I acknowledge that I teach at a selective school um, and historically that's meant that I haven't had so many GCC foundation tier resources because I don't teach them at my school. Um, and even though I actually teach quite a lot of um, uh, lower probability students um, outside of school for tutoring, for example. Um, so it meant I didn't have so many resources. So I've tried to remedy that recently. Um, so I've been making some GCC foundation tier resources. So this is, for example, counting uh, to find area and perimeter, there's like on breeding scales. I've also tried to decommission my year specific resources. So for example, we might teach compound measures in year eight and then again in GCSE. So I have like a year eight compound measures resource um, because that's what I needed at the time when I, when I was making the slides. But actually, I don't want that now because like you might not teach compound measures the first time in year eight. Um, so I've tried to sort of break them up so they're non-year specific. So I've been gradually decommissioning old year specific resources and replacing them with uh, newer ones where you have a mixture of foundation and higher tier questions. Um, well, or separately, so I've tried to differentiate it so the resource can be used both for foundation tier and for higher tier in a sort of a later section of the slides. Um, for the upper end of the spectrum, you've got the UKMT database, so Maths Challenge Questions, which are organised by topic. And what's quite nice is it uses the same topic structure as all the exam questions. So if you're doing a very, like, um, a kind of a particular topic in the, the GCC syllabus, you can also find some uh, problem solving questions from Maths Challenge papers within the same mix, which is quite cool. And the UKMT, they link to my site. So I've effectively become the, the de facto UKMT database and, and they, they link to me. And I, I try to make sure that's uh, kept up to date. Uh, also, this is a year 12 club, the Riemann Zeta Club that I run for um, students who are interested in maybe doing maths at university. And that teaches you there's basically just slides and worksheets um, to do with teaching people the, the stuff they need to know for Senior Maths Challenge, the British Maths Olympiad, and kind of university entry type stuff. Um, so those have been those have been pretty popular. They're, they're some of my oldest resources. I made them about um, eight years, seven years ago, those. Um, and I, I barely tinkered them with actually. Uh, the very last thing, uh, in terms of impact on our own results, um, you might think I was a, a selective school. There's not really much room for value added, but look at this. This is junior maths um, challenge gold certificates. Um, so 50 sounds really good, but um, for a grammar school, that's so-and-so. Um, and then look at this. So over the last eight years, um, seven years, we've managed to tri pretty much triple our number of junior math challenge gold certificates. And I believe that 136 figure in 2019 is 
uh, the highest in the UK. And that's even when you consider private schools and such. My, my school is a, a state school, I should add. Uh, and yes, student, and partly I think that is because students have been using my platform so much. And if you look at the stats and how they've been using doing mass challenge questions on my site, it's like loads, they're obsessed with it, particularly in the run up to the mass challenges, they just do loads of them. And that's what, partly why we get so many gold certificates. And my to-do list before I get onto the demo, finally. Um, so yeah, the big thing at the moment, big concentration is just trying to um, get the rest of the key skills platform ready for September. So as I said, we're up to about 350 skills at the moment, uh, but we want to get to about a thousand um, by September. So Gaten's doing most of the programming and I'm doing uh, most of the videos. Also, literally over the next couple of weeks, um, I want you to be able to build worksheets with key skills questions. So you'd be able to fix a set of key skills questions. Um, so that will be coming very soon. Uh, also, you can't currently sort of see a breakdown by topic on key skills. So if I want to see how good a student was at sort of algebra key skills, you can't currently do that, but that's coming very soon. I've planned that from the outset. Um, I've had to sort of put key stage five videos on hiatus. I've made a lot of them. I got through about three quarters of the pure syllabus, um, but I haven't got any applied videos. But to be honest, I've got so much work on this other stuff that it's going to be quite a long time before I finish those. And then collaboration with a number of international exam boards. So even since a couple of weeks ago, CCEA. But it's used quite a lot with um, international British schools of overseas. For example, Michael's school um, in Cairo. Um, but I would like it to be used by non-British uh, non schools as well overseas. So I need to collaborate with um, other exam boards in other countries to be able to do that. And I need basically more staff in order to be able to do that. Also multilingual support. The first language might be Welsh actually. So um, Educast is very generously putting the questions themselves. They've got um, one of their editors to do that. Um, and they've asked about whether I can have questions in Welsh. And don't worry, your students won't, in England won't suddenly get some random Welsh questions. There'll be some internationalization, uh, sorry, can't pronounce that, internationalization kind of built in there. Um, also Desmos out of the blue just contacted me saying, oh, can you use our API on your site? If you haven't seen uh, Desmos, it's like an online graphing calculator and such. Um, and it means soon um, there will be things like uh, being able to draw curves on my site. So questions where you have to draw a quadratic or whatever. Box plot questions, you'll be able to draw box plot questions as well. Um, so that's coming in. Um, and the charity conversion. Like I'm not, as I said, I'm not in it for the money. Uh, my site makes some kind of operational income from uh, very minimal uh, and very restrictive adverts. Um, and, uh, but it's not enough to sort of have um, kind of full members of staff and such. So I, I have more traffic than say um, Manga High nowadays and they have a staff team of over 20 and we have two full-time teachers doing this on the side. So you can imagine the pressure we're under. I've, I've worked like seven to midnight every day and I'm, I'm not sure I can quite sustain that. So um, if I convert to a charity then I might be able to get some funding from uh, uh, generous rich friends or um, foundations and such and um, uh, and I might even be able to get rid of adverts because I don't like adverts, I don't like having them, I'd rather not have them um, but uh, if my funding could be replaced with other funding then then I'll do that and sleep because I don't get much. <laughs> I've started like literally yesterday. I've got alarm for my phone. It says, it, 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 um, so yesterday it was for 10.30 p.m. because I usually go to bed about midnight. It said, go to sleep now in all caps. And I actually did. So I had like a five minute, 10 minute warning. And I did actually go to sleep. And I feel a lot better this morning because <laughs> I had like eight and a half hours sleep. Um, right, anyway, demo time. Um, it's my lovely background. Bing has this new like random background app thing. And I absolutely love it. So these lovely foxes here. Um, right, demo time getting distracted. Um, so I've anonymized this. Um, so anonymized mode, by the way, is where I've scrambled all the names. So uh, you won't be able to see any of my data for data protection reasons. Um, and you can actually get the anonymized yourself if you want to demo to people at other schools. So if you go to the settings menu and you go to turn on anonymize, uh, it will scramble the names. Um, and there are, you can also turn it off as well. You won't, the, well, most of these orange things you won't see because this is for me as an admin. Um, so when you log in, um, you will see this dashboard. This is the home dashboard. And I'll try and explain briefly the uh, various things going on here. So you've got, um, this is the weekly summary. So it shows the number of homeworks have been set. That figure is starting to go down now because we're getting towards the end of school. I'm impressed actually that 17 homeworks have been set this week uh, at my school. 
and then still like 10,000 questions answered. The students are still going. Um, lots of points. Um, just to warn you, I'm resetting the total points this year for each school and each student in a couple of weeks' time because I want students to be rewarded for doing um, work over the holiday. Uh, they still get to keep their overall points, but the, the school points this year for each student, uh, that's going to be resetting to zero in a few weeks' time. I'll try and give students warning about that. Um, you can also see the top students this week. Uh, and if you go to summary by class, this is quite nice. Um, it calculates um, summary for each form, uh, each class that you've set up, and you can see the activity over a different time period um, or a different year group. So that's quite cool. Just to get a, a weekly summary or a monthly summary. Um, here you can set some work, and obviously we're going to be trying that out. Um, then uh, the GFM whiteboard is a virtual whiteboard where you can connect with other students, and uh, we'll have a good time on that later. Uh, this is the latest homework. So uh, this is my top set. Uh, I set them an optional task. So I think there's one lesson I couldn't come to. So I set them an IMC paper. Um, it's completed by 10 of them, but I think most of them pretty much finished it. Um, DFM Live, that's the kind of game that we'll get to play at the end. And you're like, that, that's the one thing at the end of this thing where people say, at this, this um, demo where people say, oh, that's amazing. I didn't know that was there. Uh, and then they go straight away to play it with their classes. Um, can you log your students on without the school's knowledge? Um, I don't know what you mean by that. If you could explain that later, what you mean by without the school's knowledge, and then that'd be, I'd be grateful. Um, key skills um, is the new platform I was talking about. These fine-grained, randomly generated questions for repetitive practice. The activity log um, is, uh, I'll show you later, is like a timeline of student activity, both um, homeworks they've completed and independent practice as well. Um, you've got the notifications here, by the way. So this is all the activity recently. So I can actually click on one of these. So this student's done a um, practice, a few topics. Um, so if I click that, it goes to that student um, and you can see all their answers. So these are the questions, the correct answer and their answer. And I can provide feedback to the student here, uh, etc. But I'm not gonna do that now. If you quickly, quickly click on one of these, I can quickly go to that uh, incorrect answer. Um, but yeah, I'll be, I'll be showing that later if I go back to the home dashboard. Uh, are those statistics, e.g. 17 homeworks set, your own homeworks? I believe it's for the whole school. So this is a school summary rather than your summary. And the last few things, uh, you can build a worksheet. So I'll show you how to do that. It's like a collection of exam questions where you can then export it like on exam wizards or you can set it to your students. Um, exam questions by topic. Um, that's the first thing I'm gonna show you. And then your settings, so like managing classes, schemes of work, etc. You can also access full past papers. I'll show you that later. And you can even modify those past papers so you can um, set abridged papers to students. And then resources. So let's start with that actually. I'm gonna go to the resources section. Um, you can also get it in this menu here, so resources and all this stuff here. If I just click that. Um, this is the resources homepage. Um, and I've tried to basically have everything available on the site, uh, resource-wise, in one place. So um, you've got access to the videos here, the questions, um, certain teaching resources here, uh, the DFM whiteboard, etc. And a nice video from Craig Barton, if you've heard him before, um, salivating about one of my resources. Um, but you've got the topic structure here. And by the way, if you set up a scheme of work, I'm not going to show you how to set up a scheme of work in this session. Um, but if you do go to settings and then manage schemes of work, there's a really helpful uh, video there which explains exactly how to do it. But if you set one up, I can just go to say year eight and then select a term like autumn one, and then it immediately goes to uh, the topics in uh, that term um, scheme of work, which is quite cool. But let's select a topic from the left. I'm gonna go to area and perimeter. Um, so you can see all the slides available in this column. So these are the, literally the PowerPoints I've produced the worksheets. So you can see that foundation tier resource on uh, counting to find the area and perimeter, et cetera. So I can just click that to download. Um, you've got a link to the key skills system. So if I click that, that goes to the key skills platform and I'll, I'll show you that later. Um, and then you've also got exam questions by subtopic. So um, for students, they can uh, practice questions on the exam questions on that topic. Uh, they can watch your videos. So if I click here, you've got then goes to the video interface. And I can watch my video on this. And you've got nice little links which immediately access the various parts of the site on that. Um, if I go back, uh, you've also got the teachers. You can instantly sort of uh, go to the browse questions facility for that kind of exam question. That's the next thing I'm going to show you. Um, 
uh, it says here, do you have to populate resources to the cell? Um, no, you basically, with, when you set up the scheme of work, you select what topics you want, and then um, it will basically automatically show all the stuff available for those topics, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, can you set what you're doing as a task? I watched a video to the practice questions. Um, yes, so um, you can set, um, well, I'll show you how to set homework on a specific topic. And there is an option to require students to watch the videos if you wish. So don't worry about that. Um, teachers will ask questions uh, to, work, to work on. So that just means I need to work on this topic, <laughs> even though I'm a teacher, that should probably not be there. Um, but also the topic tests, by the way, are, um, they're basically um, pre, we've col collated a bunch of questions. So we made little mini tests consisting of eight exam questions each. So there's usually an easier one and a harder one for each topic, so like standard and advanced. Um, and it's basically intended if students have finished a topic, they want a little mini assessment to see how they're doing. You can set that as a teacher as well, um, uh, which I'll show you later. Um, and it's just a nice way for students to see if they get the topic. If they get at least six out of eight, they get a nice little topic medal, which I'll see here on topic medals, and they can get points for each topic and such. So that's sort of showing a summary of everything a student can see uh, by topic um, or by key skill. Um, now, if we go to browse questions, you can either click a particular topic, or if I go back to the home dashboard, by the way, if you click this home icon here, this house icon at the top, that goes back to the dashboard. So let's go to exam questions by topic. So this is just a nice useful resource. Students won't be able to access this by the way, so they can't generally browse the whole database of questions. Um, will the students need to have an account with DFM to be able to access the resources and do homework? Yes, they will do. Um, and I'll show you how to do that later. So let's go to exam questions by topic, which is a teacher only thing. And it's very simple to use. You just literally got a bunch of filters on the left and then you select a question and it'll show here. So if I go to filter by topic, um, so that was the top left here, in case you missed that, filter by topic. And then let's go, if I don't know, Pythagoras, a shape, Pythagoras, 2D Pythagoras. And then it, there's 417 matching questions. As I said, it's a large database. Um, we can also filter by difficulty. Um, it explains this elsewhere on the site, but just to give you an overview of difficulty levels, level one is um, like the sort of bare bones of like what a question can be, like the very simplest a question can be for that particular topic. Um, levels two and three are sort of, um, sort of easy and hard exam questions, and then level four is kind of like beyond uh, the expectations of what students are expected to do in sort of typical exam setting. Um, rule of thumb, if it's a GCC question, uh, foundation tier tends to be a mix of difficulty levels one and two, and higher tier we make sort of difficulty levels two and three, and we would not typically make a exam question, a pass paper exam question at level four. So level four is particularly like math challenge and Olympiad questions, for example. Um, Right, uh, you can also filter by author. So you've got LXL, AQA. Even as of like yesterday, you can actually filter to user contributed questions. So you can actually build your own questions. Um, so let's go to LXL. And then there's 94 Pythagoras um, uh, questions by LXL. And then let's say I've got this one. Um, so I've selected a question. You can answer it here if you want. So I can put in an answer and it will instantly feed back with the mark scheme. So this is more for like a classroom setting. I particularly use this browse facility, like if I need to find an ad hoc question quickly, like let's say students haven't done so well a question in class, and I just want to find another question, I use that to sort of just quickly pick another one. And um, there's a really lovely button, um, which I added a month ago, this annotate button on the right. So if you click that, it automatically loads the question in the DFM whiteboard, which I will, I'll be showing you before later, but you can see there's loads of exam questions. I can just annotate over this now. So I can call this like A, B, C, and then I can do sort of like A squared plus 6.7 squared, et cetera, and write over that. Um, and if you have connected student whiteboards, you, you, can, you can actually project that onto the student screens, which is quite cool. So I'll be showing you that later, but let's close up for now. Um, also the filter by text is quite useful if you just wanna like, um, let's say you found a question and like in the text in it, like an image somewhere that a student shows you and you want to find the question in my day space, um, I often use it for that. But also let's just say you want to filter to IGCC questions, because LXL have an IGCC syllabus, I can type in IGCC into that filter and then it's now filtered it to the 40 IGCC questions. So you can see here um, these exam codes. And by the way, when students get these questions, they don't see the exam code, so they won't be able to see where the question is from, just in case you're concerned about that. 
Um, so yeah, these are all the IGCC questions, which is quite cool. If you're selecting UKMT questions, I often use a filter to, um, to say if I'm going to filter to JMC questions. There's only one, um, because to be honest, Pythagoras doesn't come up in JMC. IMC, there'll be a lot more, the intermediate mass challenge. So that, that's a really useful facility there. Right, uh, back to the home page. I think I'm going to show you now to um, set work. Yeah, so this is the, the, the main event as such, how you set homework. I will also be showing you briefly how to set up classes later, but there is a nice video there which I'll point you to um, on how to do that. Um, so if you click, click set work, now, literally, I replaced this interface this morning. So that's how um, current it is. I, it, it was pretty similar before. But what I've done is I made it clearer the distinction between key skills homework. So as I said, they're fine grained question types where students can repetitively practice randomly generated questions with accompanying short worked example videos. Or you've got the kind of exam bank. So um, the questions from all these exam boards and user contributed questions. But the, the thing is, these are sort of fixed, a fixed database of questions where these are sort of randomly generated, dynamically generated questions. So there's a bunch of options. So we can do a key skills homework or um, we can, you can choose the questions yourself. So you can build a collection of questions very quickly and I will show you how to do that in a second um, and then set that specific set of questions to your students. Or you can uh, start with a past paper as a sort of like template and then modify a bit and then set that to your students. Very easy to do. Um, you've got the topic tests I was mentioning. So those are sort of like the mini tests um, that we've already chosen the questions for you um, that can be set to students and um, they can get topic medals for that. And then questions by topic. So let's do that first. If I click that, that then goes to this. Um, so a bunch of options here, but mostly self-explanatory. So set task four, and then I can select a particular class. So uh, I'm gonna go for my test class. Uh, so as I said, these names are scrambled. Um, so I'll click them. Um, and then due date, you can set what it's due for. Uh, on the actually elsewhere on the site, you can, there's a little calendar. So you can select any arbitrary date rather than being limited to certain options you can select the particular day and um, they'll basically get an email if they haven't um they'll get a warning email i think five hours before the deadline to say they haven't done it or i think oh, what is it i think it's 7 p.m uh, the day before the homework's due i think that's how i coded it um to say you haven't done your homework yet please do it um and they'll also get um, a more ominous email when they haven't done the homework and the deadline passes um so they'll get an automated email um, you can also either set it immediately or if you've used Google Classroom before, you'll know about the sort of scheduling facility. So I can schedule it for a specific time uh, and we use that for assessment because we want to say this class is going to have their end of year assessment 9am on Thursday morning. So you can schedule it for the future. They won't be able to see it before then and they'll get an email at the time to say uh, that this assessment's now, uh, you can now do it. Here's the link directly to it. So that's quite cool. Um, I'm just going to do it immediately. Um, and then uh, we can select some topics. So it's, I don't know, uh, algebra, expanding brackets, and then expand a single bracket. Um, then if you set up some team schemes of work, you can select from here if you wish. So we saw autumn one before on the various skills and that scheme of work, if you've set that up. Um, difficulty levels, I mentioned these before. And if you click this link here, click for guidance, that will explain um, the different um, difficulty levels again. Um, but what auto means is that um, because this, uh, uh, this is not fixed questions, so different students might get different questions from the database. It kind of picks it from the pool of questions. And what's quite cool, if I select auto one to three, let's say a student has never encountered single bracket questions before, expanding those, then they would start at level one. Yeah? Um, and as they get questions right, I think you have to, if you get five right on a level, you then uh, you go up a difficulty level. Um, and it was restricted to that range, obviously, but then they would advance to level two. So let's say a student has already done some expanding brackets questions in the past, um, and they're already up to level three. That means if you set the difficulty level to one to three, they would start with level three questions. So there's like automatic differentiation there, which is quite cool. Um, you can filter to author. Um, be wary that if certain key stage five topics that are like obscure ones if you make it too restrictive and have a particular very specific author there might not be many matching questions so just be wary about that i think spanning brackets there'll be billions so uh, we don't have to worry um one went wrong basically if they um get the question wrong then they there's a little pop-up message that says wink wink you may want to reconsider your answer there's various random amusing messages there um and um 
uh, they'll then have a second chance. And actually, it is recorded that they had a second go, although at the moment it, is in, it doesn't actually report on the progress interface that they had the second go. So I will do that at some point because um, the data is recorded, just not presented to you. Prevent reattempts. Um, and by the way, if you click this question mark, it'll explain how that works. Um, but um, prevent reattempts. If they finish the homework, they have they can have another go and they'll get a fresh set of questions. Remember, these are. Um, Different students get different questions. There's not a fixed set of questions for this particular mode, because um, it's by topic. Um, but they'll get a fresh set of questions when, when they have another go. I can prevent reattempts if I want. Uh, you can require videos to be watched. So if you click yes, they'll have to watch the video on expanding a single bracket. Um, then you can require working. If you select yes, they have to provide the working using a little mini whiteboard on the side. And then obviously com completion criteria. So you can select a particular accuracy. They have to get four out of the last five right um, at any difficulty in this particular case or a fixed number of questions. Let's just do that. Um, now, remember I said it's a, it selects the questions all automatically from a pool of questions. Now, if you click preview questions, that will show the pool of questions they might get. Um, but I'm not gonna click that now, but if you did click that, you'd be able to see that. So let's select, set the task. Um, now, this pop-up is basically warning me that, because um, if you think about it, exam questions might involve more than one skill. So you could have, for example, expanding bracket question, which also involves collecting like terms. So I can imagine a question like that, like, I don't know, two brackets, X plus three, close brackets, minus three brackets, four minus X, expand and simplify. So that involves expanding, but it also involves in collecting like terms once they've done the expansion. So um, this allows you to sort of allow what skills expanding brackets questions allow to combine with. That's particularly important if say, I don't know, you, or we teach Pythagoras at the end of year seven, but I don't want Pythagoras questions to involve any trigonometry. So this facility allows you to prevent um, certain topics mixing um, in certain ways. Um, now, if you've set up a scheme of work and I haven't allocated a scheme of work to this test class, then this list will be dramatically reduced because the scheme of work also allows you to specify what things students are expected to know. And so if a student is already expected to know collecting like terms, then you won't see that on this list. So it's quite clever in that way. Um, so if I do select task, then it will go to the progress interface and I can now see that expanding brackets on the right here, this is for my test class. Um, and I can see that it's due for those students. And as they do the homework, it will appear in this table here. And uh, I will show you the progress interface later, but you can select between the tasks here. So if I go to, um, oh, that's that particular test class. If I go for another class, then I can see all the tasks that they've done and uh, like collecting like terms, et cetera, and see the uh, individual answers. Um, so that's how you do that. Now, if I go back to set um, some work again, and by the way, I don't actually use questions by topic very much because as I said, that you don't know exactly what questions are going to get, and it's slightly potluck. So um, uh, I tend to like to have more control of my homework. So I typically more use um, you choose the questions, um, or right if I'm it's a revision, um, if it's like year eleven, I like to set them a pass paper each week or a bridge pass paper. That gives you really useful data. Um, the topic test I often use and the key skills. I I tend not to use that option very much. Um, anymore, which is why I've tried to make it less prominent on this interface. Um, right, let's do you choose the questions now. This is absolutely amazing, this interface. So if I click this, you choose the questions. Um, yeah, once you've done, you can either set as work or export to Word, um, blah, blah, blah. So it's pretty intuitive. Look, click to choose question. Let's say I want to make uh, a fraction homework. So let's filter. This is like the same interface as the browse interface we saw earlier. So filter by topic go to, uh, let's say fractions of an amount. So fractions, find the fraction of an amount. And we've got lots of questions here. Let's filter to, I don't know, OCR. Um, so you've got half of two, half of 12, that's a difficulty level one question. There is a nice button here, use all parts of this exam question if the, there's multiple parts, but I just wanna use that one part. Let's add one more, so plus, click to choose question. As you can see, it's like super simple, this. Um, and you can browse the questions there or, or have more filters or whatever. So use this question. Um, and then what I can do, I need to save it first. If I do save as, save as button, let's select it. Fraction, oh, so I clicked off it by mistake. Oh, it just auto saved it in the background. That's quite a nice facility as well. Okay. So uh, you've got 
Um, I'm not going to explain the, the directory system, but everyone, when you register, you get your own directory within your school directory. Um, but the school directory, Tiffin School, also has like a restricted folder. It creates automatically. Um, it, we put our landmarks and core assessments in there, so the students wouldn't be able to see that. Um, there's also a shared folder within Tiffin School, uh, and, for, and there'll be automatically one for your school as well, uh, which are worksheets that you want students to be able to access themselves. Um, so you can set the permissions. I'm not going to explain that now. Submit. Um, so now saved it. You can see the, the topic structure on the, the, the directory structure on the left. Um, and now I have a bunch of options. So um, I could export to Word. So if I do that, click that button, there's a few export options. I'm not going to explain those now, but they're pretty self-explanatory. And then let's click this. Uh, it's opening up. And there we go. So look, it's even worked out the total marks. Uh, that question, um, this one, and then you've got the mark schemes at the end. Isn't that pretty cool? So we use that to pr produce our printed, all our actual core assessments at school now, so for the, the printed ones. Um, even if we're not actually using the online platform to do the test of the time, they do it on paper usually, um, we can still produce these printed assessments and it saved us so much time to, to be able to quickly find questions like that. Uh, can you have multiple teachers per class? Yes. And you might also ask, can you have multiple classes per student? Yes, you can also do that, which I'll briefly show you later. Um, so uh, we've got that. There's also set to students. So if you click set to students, uh, whoa, that is a bug. Um, I don't know what happened there. Sorry. I think it was just a lag. Um, let me find it again. So it's my directory. Uh, sort by last updated. I have to look into that. Fractional amounts. There we go. It's there again. So if I go to set to students, um, then you've got similar options to before. So I can select who the task is for with a due date. And notice with this version, you can actually select any arbitrary date in the future, like five years in the future if you wanted to. Um, the warn went wrong, prevent re attempt, require working, uh, require videos that has, uh, if it, you put yes, um, then because if you think about it, if you, let's say you were, spoke, you were set a past paper to students with like, I don't know, 30 questions, that might involve like 30 different skills. Now you don't want to require every single video because it would take them a whole day to watch them. So um, you would then pick the one. So uh, in this case, there's only one skill involved in that particular work, that worksheet, so I can select that. Um, you can select a time limit. Um, so that'll be have like a countdown timer. Um, and then you can set immediately. Uh, accuracy measure. Now what this is, if, if all the, the, the questions in your selection are like exam board questions, um, then they will all have association marks for those questions. So you can then choose to use exam marking accuracy. Um, and by the way, again, these question marks here explain everything. So it explains everything you need to know. Um, and that basically means, let's say that first question they can just about see is two marks. That means if they get it right, they get two marks. If they get it wrong, they get zero marks. So it actually uses the marks for the questions. And you might wonder, well, how do they get one mark? Well, um, if you've allowed them to submit working, um, you could then subsequently later as a teacher edit their marks to award partial marks, which is quite cool. Um, there's also, add, um, I should add, with require working, there's optional as well. So um, if you select no, it just won't record their working at all. Even though they've used the whiteboard, it just discards that data um, once they submit the question. If you click yes, they have to use it. And if it's optional, it will record it if they've written, if they've drawn something on the whiteboard. Otherwise, it, it, it doesn't require it. So that's quite useful. Um, and the difference between homework and assessment um, is homework's more of a casual affair. So they get, they get, the student gets instant feedback after every question. So it'll say whether it's right or wrong and show them the mark scheme and such. Um, and they'll see their mark at the, immediately at the end. Um, if you set it as an assessment, if I click that, um, can you see like it's deactivated certain options? So warn when wrong, no. If it's a formal assessment, you don't want to give them a warning. And also it doesn't, it prevents them from re-attempting because you don't want to allow them to re-attempt an assessment. Um, so that's kind of a more formal affair. They do not get feedback after each question. So it just says your answer has been recorded. And uh, a recent change, they don't even see their final mark at the end. So they won't know how they did until, um, now I advise with an assessment actually selecting a due date. So let's say you make the due date like an hour after you know everyone's going to have finished assessment. And then at that particular time, then students will get a notification on their dashboard saying, the answers are now available for the assessment and they can then review their answers and see the correct answers. So uh, we did that for our end of year assessments and that worked really well. So that's the way I advise. I don't advise setting assessment without a due date. So, so I advise doing that. Um, 
also I know if you said it's assessment, they don't even, um, so as I said, they don't see the exam code in the question anyway. They don't even see the author as well if it's an assessment. So they can't see where the question is from at all. Um, so those are all the, the sort of the options here if you're setting a fixed set of questions. So the option before, the mode before was when you select the topics and it selects the questions for you and it differentiates based on ability, etc. Whereas here, we've set that we, we said we want these two specific questions and every student will get those two particular questions. You know, you might think, well, how can I select a, um, a past paper? Well, you can either go set work, set homework, um, past papers. Um, and then we can access a paper. So let's just go to, I don't know, LXL. Um, you know, there's loads here. Uh, nine to one foundation. And then let's select a particular paper. Now, what you could do is you could just set that paper as so a set to students. Um, but you might think, oh, it's a bit long, a whole paper. So I'm going to be generous. I'm going to delete some questions. So can you see the edit mode here? If you click edit mode on the right here, that checkbox, then we can change the question. So I can sort of click the cross to get rid of a bunch of questions. I can drag questions around to reorder them if I want. That's quite cool. Uh, and if I click a question, you can replace it. So you can modify as to your heart's content. So you've started the past paper as a template, um, but then you can modify as much as you like. Um, note that uh, the save, that save button should be grayed out for you. It's only not grayed out because I'm an admin, um, but you will be able to save as. So you need to save as your own copy first um, in the usual way, and that will then enable you to set it to students. Um, by the way, if you want to see what it looks like as a student practicing it, uh, if you click practice mode, that goes into sort of student mode and you'll be able to see what it looks like as a student. Um, if you want the direct link to it, the share button here, um, etc. And you can still export this to Word. So that's how that works um, in terms of setting fixed questions to students. Um, right, the next thing on this list is, oh, how can you see what a student sees? Well, that's a good question. So um, different ways... Uh, the, well, the best way actually is if you go to manage classes, so let's say you've set up a class, um, do you have questions which require drawing as an answer? Drawing a plan view as shape? Oh yes, I do. Um, if I go back to exam questions by topic, let's go to filter by topic, uh, let's go to solids, plans and elevations since you, you said. Um, so we go to space, measures, uh, constructions, uh, draw the front elevation, side elevation or plan. That sounds uh, like the answer to your question. Um, now, there's not a huge number of exam questions on this, but um, there are some. Uh, some are multiple choice. Oh, there we go. Look, we get to draw it. So they get to draw the shape uh, just with their mouse or with their pen. I think it snaps the nearest half thing and then submit answer. Uh, I got it wrong. Uh, it was like that, yeah, with the mark scheme. Isn't that cool? Really cool. Um, you can also draw cumulative frequency graphs, bar charts, histograms, everything. So. Um, it's much more versatile than most of the other platforms. Yes, wow indeed, thank you. Um, right, um, then next thing is how, do you can see, how can you see what a student sees? So this is amazing facility. If you go to uh, cog icon, uh, manage classes, or you can see it down here, settings, manage classes. Um, now if I go to a particular class, oh God, this is scrambled, isn't it? Um, because I'm in anonymized mode. I'm gonna try and find my year nine class. Uh, oh my God. Um, no, that's actually year eight. Oh, that's my class, brilliant. Um, so I'll show you the managed class interface later, but I just wanna show you this one particular button. Um, can you see this use demo class account button there? Now, um, if oh, someone's asking, would the pupil be able to complete homework using a phone? Yes, it's optimized for usage on phones as well. So don't worry about that. Um, so if I use demo class account, then it's basically every time you create a class, it also creates a sort of hidden demo class account for that class, um, which prevents you having to set up some dummy account that you can use yourself. Um, so it does that automatically. Um, and basically any homework you set to the whole class will automatically be set to that demo class as well. Um, so if I then go to, um, so we just, I mentioned that lesson I had the other day for this top set, uh, intermediate math challenge. If I click that, um, this is what a student would see. So they see this kind of um, opening welcome page. It says the sort of uh, completion criteria as a time limit and the video is available. So it's detected all the videos um, based on the skills in that particular intermediate math challenge paper. So I could watch them, understand equivalent fractions and watch the video on that. Hello and welcome to this video on equivalent fractions. And by the way, it says where they are in the videos. If I came back to that, it would know where I am. Um, and if you've required them to watch videos, then it will say which videos they have to watch. And uh, can you watch videos during the homework? Yes, I'll show you that. Um, 
it will say which videos required if I required videos and then basically they won't be able to click that start button if they, until they've done so. Um, so if I just click start, uh, these are questions. Uh, you can see the horrible ads that I don't like. And this is the whiteboard I was mentioning. Uh, they can draw little shapes and things like that and they can use a text tool. So hello, Bob, et cetera. Yeah, so um, that's the whiteboard. It, they can hide it if they want. Uh, it hides automatically once they've submitted an answer. Um, so here are all the questions. In fact, oh, I've already started this. Um, I'm on question four now. Um, so between them, Ginger Victoria eat two thirds of a cake. If Ginger eats one quarter of the cake, what fraction of the cake does? Um, yeah, so I'm going to do, isn't it just two thirds minus a quarter? <laughs> I can't believe I'm actually doing maths uh, here. Um, and there's five twelve. So I hope that's right. I feel I'm going to be stupid. Yes, it is. It's right. Oh, I've got some points. So this is how the point system works. So um, I've got some points because it was uh, adding or subtracting proper and proper fractions and stuff. Um, so they'll see that. Um, and that's quite cool. Uh, and they can go to the next question. Or they can even continue later. Um, they can't continue later if it's an assessment, by the way, because they're supposed to do all in one go. Um, yeah. And by the way, someone asked, can you watch the videos? Look, here we go. Get video help on this topic. So if I click that, um, then it brings up the video on add, adding and subtracting fractions. It's really convenient that. Um, so that's that. Um, right, I hope that's clear enough. Um, so next thing to show you is, if I go back to the dashboard, I believe is the key skills interface. Yes, so. Um, you can ask, oh wait, um, by the way, if you're on the demo account um, thing, there's not an easy way to exit. You have to just, uh, you, you're now logged on as that student. So I'm going to have to log off. So if I go to account menu, log out, and then I'm just going to log in again. Uh, and I'm going to have to quickly get this off screen because I need to anonymize again so you don't see my data. Uh, anonymize. Right, there we go. Um, so, uh, it should have been anonymized, is it? Just checking, yes it is. Right, so if I go to um, uh, key skills here, or you can get it from questions, uh, key skills there as well. So this is awesome. So this is the, the, um, the new interface and it's gigantic. So um, yeah, we're, we're up to three un there's 320 skills. There is actually more that we've done, but we just haven't made them live yet. They're kind of under development, but we'll get to a thousand by September. That's the target. Um, so I can see recent student activity here. Um, and just to remind you, in case you've forgotten, rather than exam question, these are um, uh, randomly generated questions on very specific question types um, designed for repetitive practice, yeah? So um, if I go to say, oh, let's go to, again, if you set up a scheme of work, I can go to year eight, which I went to before, and it has all the key skills here. It's a very specific, like find the missing angles in a non-regular polygon, find the size of the exterior angle of a regular polygon, find the size of the interior angles of a regular polygon, find the number of sides of a regular polygon given the size of the exterior angles. It, very specific types of questions. So let's show you how you can do various stuff with it. Uh, and I can see I'm apparently a master expanding a single bracket because I've done some questions on that as a teacher. Um, so if I go down to say the, the skill tree on the left, that's another way. And by the way, you can also get a full list. So there's a full list of skills if you want to see all of them all at once. Uh, it's a very long list. Let's go to trigonometry because I've actually made some videos on that. Now, can you see these here? You've got these video icons are not grayed out because I've actually made some videos on those. So these are like worked example videos. And yes, they can view them during the actual um, homework. So, and the difference with these with the other videos you saw is that they're, they're shorter and they're, they generally only cover at most two examples generally one word example for that very specific kind of question. So look, this one is only one minute 47. It's a very short video. And it's on very specific, look, labeling sides of a right angle triangle. Um, so I only try to cover one thing at once with these key skills. Um, it's, it's only skipped there because I've already started watching this in other demos. So, Hello, welcome to the Yeah, so I haven't made many of these yet. I've literally done three, but <laughs> I will be um, getting to thousands by September. Um, probably without much sleep. Um, let's say you want to preview some questions on this before setting it. So uh, let's say these three here. Uh, if I go to preview, it will generate random questions on those particular skills. And if I click get fresh examples, oh, new questions. Um, now, yeah, and you can see that the, the diagram varies in terms of orientation and stuff. Um, and uh, so if I just select that, let's put in a, just a, a, a bad answer. 
Uh, and this is like dynamic, this is randomly generated feedback on that randomly generated question, which is quite cool. Um, so yeah, it's a work in progress, but, but it's already pretty powerful. Um, if you want to set to students, you can do it in the usual way. So set to students. And then can you see that's pretty much identical dialogue to when you were setting a fixed question homework? Um, the only difference is, um, oh yeah, interleave skills. Now, if you've selected more than one skill, um, you can either say, oh, let's oscillate between those three skills. It'll be, go skill one, skill two, skill three, skill one, skill two, except based on those three skills I've selected. Um, or if I don't interleave, then basically it will uh, have all the labeling sides of the triangle questions first, then all the sign calls tan to find a side, etc. Um, so if it's a fixed number of questions, then it would basically give equal allocation to each of them. So if you set 12 questions, it'll be four on each, um, depending. Um, and if you select achieve a certain accuracy and I decide to interleave and, and I decided not interleave, then basically they'll have to get four out of the last five questions right on labeling sides of the triangle first before they then get quite a block of questions on using trig to find sides. And they have to get four out of five right on that. And then they get onto the last section. So that's if it's not interleaved. Um, whereas if you interleave it, they basically have to get four out of five right on that type of question before it stops cycling for that question. So if I then make the criteria on labeling sides, it will then only interleave between the remaining skills, if that makes sense. Uh, I just basically say, just try it out and see what it looks like. Um, you can have a go as a teacher. So if you click have a go, it will show you what it looks like as a student as if you'd set the task to them. So I do that. Uh, do I want to interleave? Yes, uh, 10 questions. And then there we go. And that is the opposite submit answer. There we go. Yeah. Oh, look, and I've got a key skill point. So the point system is slightly different for key skills. It's simpler. Um, basically, if they get a question right, they get a key skill point. If they get to six, so if they got six questions right on that key skill, they get to completion. If they get to 10, they get to master. Um, they can do more questions they want. They just won't get past 10. Um, and that, that pie chart you saw on the key skill homepage reflects how many key skills they've seen. Um, so let's go back. Oh, and by the way, the worked example, they will be able to see it here. So they can watch it beforehand or they can watch it during while they're doing it. So if they're stuck, they can then watch the video. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, just to show you on the key skills again, um, some of the really cool ones that we've done. And look, you can see the pie chart here. So what I've started, et cetera. And I believe if I click that, oh no, I have to click the button. I'll, I'll make it so you can click the pie chart. Um, that will go to the 20 key skills they've started, um, but haven't got to completion yet. So I can see I've done two out of 10, et cetera. Um, how many videos are there? Um, for the main videos on the exam skills videos, um, there's about 300 I've made. Um, the key skill system, which is the brand new thing, uh, there's three videos so far, but um, I'm trying to get to a thousand by September. So it's a tall order, certainly. Um, can you see if the students watch the video or not? Yes, I'll show you that in a, in a bit. Um, I'm, I'm conscious we're slightly running out of time. Um, just a, one really cool thing to show, can they review these skills later in year nine and year 10? Yes, of course, yeah. So they, they can select any other scheme of work from previous classes. Yeah, I'm gonna show you how to create classes, don't worry. Um, just one really cool key skill to show you. Um, Gayton did this the other day and it's pretty awesome. Data representation, um, histograms. Uh, yeah, these are particularly exceptional, these skills. So these are sort of the harder ones, some of them. Um, but there's literally stuff like um, number bonds, subtracting numbers, et cetera, uh, arithmetic operations. Um, if I go to a, a preview, like it's a randomly generated histogram, isn't that awesome? Um, and then look, I can draw in that and then it then explains, oh, I got it wrong, that's the right answer, here's how you'd make the calculation. Isn't that amazing? Um, and then we've got this one, and you have to make some calculation, and then it shows you like a detailed calculation about how to, and this is all randomly generated, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, right, okay, so the next thing is uh, progress interface, and then quickly setting up a class. Uh, functional skills, we're hoping to add some, um, well, there'll certainly, be, be, there'll certainly be key skills on functional skills. In terms of exam questions, we're hoping to add some functional skills papers at some point. Um, right, uh, so I said progress interface, if I can access it here. Uh, if I go to the activity log, and um, that shows you all the activity, both independent practices and um, homework students have done. So if I go to this one, this student's been practicing uh, single algebraic terms and stuff, they've got them all right. 
Um, and as a teacher, I can override the mark. Um, I can see the full mark scheme for that question, or I can provide feedback to the student as well, which is pretty cool. Um, so this student's done a topic test. Um, seems they started 10 minutes ago. They might not have finished yet, actually. So this might be live. So um, they've got some of them wrong, it seems. Um, and I can provide feedback again. Um, by the way, this checkbox here, if you select that, you can actually provide the same feedback for all the students who've answered that question wrong. Um, then uh, what the other interface is, oh, and by the way, if you want to filter to a class, like to say 7AH, I can see all the activity in, as a timeline for that one particular class. You can even select the date range if you want. Um, but let's go to another thing, uh, homework assessments. Uh, you can also access it if you just go to um, either progress by class or set work view homework, you can access this. Um, so for that particular class, it's shown all their homeworks they've had. Uh, if I just click on one of these, it will show you the students' answers for that. So this attempt one. Uh, oh, and I can see this is for their end of year exam. These ones are orange because the teacher's actually given them partial credit based on their working. Um, I think they submitted their working via Google Classroom on this. Um, Google Classroom question, integration with that, um, I, I'm considering it for the future. I get asked that a lot. Um, don't worry, I will be eventually doing that. Um, I'm just going to get around to it. Uh, if I, I return, um, if I select a particular uh, task on the left, uh, or if you click that analysis button, uh, so let's go to this end of your paper, um, then it shows you all the individual answers by question. So I could click this question here at the top to see the full question if I wanted, uh, with the mark scheme, which is quite cool. Um, and then you can see all the marks down here. So if I click a particular box, uh, I can see their incorrect answer. Um, and then, so this one, I can see they got partial credit for that. Uh, if you click the overwrite button here, you can change what mark they got for that question. So they currently got one out of two. Um, so you can see the mark scheme, the question, et cetera, and you can provide feedback. So it's all pretty intuitive. Um, yeah, some students didn't seem to do that for some reason. Uh, in fact, you can see the, the answers live as they come in. So I often sit in a class if I'm actually there, or if I'm doing it remotely, I select an exam paper for them, and then I'll see the answers they come in. So this table will gradually fill up. Now, um, it doesn't automatically refresh. So if you click that refresh button here, this little button here, it will then refresh the data, which is useful if you're doing it live with your class and you want to see the answers they come in, um, like the, 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 the up-to-date view of their answers. Um, you can edit the task here, you can export it, etc. Um, this is really cool. If I go to by topic, I can see a breakdown of their performance on that particular test by topic. So I can see they didn't do so well. Uh, there must have been some really hard rounding question on that, but where, where they did really well on the business questions on that assessment. Um, I can also go to worst questions and then you can generate a Word doc with uh, all the questions ordered by how well they answered them. So the worst one first and it has the percentage of the people that got that right. So um, can you export this info? Yes, you can. So if I go to buy a question, uh, export button, or you can click export here, and then it goes to report generator. And then you can either you put the student's answer in the spreadsheet or the number of marks they got uh, if you want to do subsequent calculations yourself based on the Excel spreadsheet or correct incorrect. Yeah. Um, so that's how you get any the report generator. There's other types of reports here as well, which I just invite you to explore. So what else we got? Homeworks assessments, progress by topic. I can see basically if I, uh, this is the same class, 7AH, if I go to algebra, I can see their performance on, uh, this is all the questions they've done by topic. So expand a single bracket. And if I was to click one of these, it would show all the homeworks that those, that student has done on that particular topic. So that's pretty cool. Um, it doesn't do that for key skills questions yet. And that's what I'm going to be doing soon. Um, uh, don't worry, I'll get to the whiteboard. I, I will have time to get through this because I don't have much left to cover basically. Um, we're near the end. Um, progress by topic, leaderboards is kind of self-explanatory um, and you can generate a leaderboard page or export. Uh, videos watched, someone asked, can you see what they've watched? This class has not watched very many, um, but you can see what they've watched. Um, and I'll be expanding this to allow you to see what key skills videos they've watched as well. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll develop that eventually. Report generator showed you student knowledge. That's very advanced. I'm not going to cover that. Times table, um, you can't set a times table task yourself. Um, but the, this is everything the students have done independently. So they've, they've been quite enthusiastic about this. Um, all the times and divide tables. Uh, all feedback, that's another way you can view the feedback, like all together. So I can see this student is um, complaining about them getting the, the question wrong, and then I can feedback here. By the way, this icon up here, if I click that, um, that goes straight to the all feedback thing. So you can view all the feedback in one go, um, which is quite convenient. 
a summary shows you a summary of student activity uh, for that class. If I go to 7AH, um, I can see that, um, within that date range how many questions they answered, etc. And you can export that with that export button again. Yep. Um, right. Uh, last thing to show you is oh, yeah, setting up a class. I'm not going to explain how to do this. Um, Anybody can last class with a leaderboard? Yes. With a leaderboard, you can do it by class or by individual, and then you can have the ranking of the classes rather than individuals if you like. Um, just go to the leaderboards thing. It's self-explanatory. Um, uh, classes, manage classes. So cog icon, manage classes. Now, I'm not going to explain it now. I'm, I'm just going to say watch the video. So if you click get help here, it explains exactly how to set up um, a class. Basically, there's two main options. You can either... Um, import a spreadsheet. So if I go to bulk add, and I encourage you to do this at the start of the year. So if you want to do all your classes all at once, but also like uh, archive old accounts for students who've left the school and use existing accounts, but just move their class, use the bulk add facility. So if you click start the wizard, it will give you a spreadsheet which you download. You put your data in, like copy it from Sims or whatever, um, from your tracking, re-upload it, and it basically says, what do you want to do with these students? Gives you the opportunity to archive old students, etc. The videos, like literally, if you go to manage classes, that um, I'm going, there's going to be a get help button on every page eventually. Um, I've just waited for me to sort of finish developing all these new features. But you will just see on the home page for that facility the get help, and you can view that at any time. Yep. There's also on the dashboard, which has a summary of everything as well. Um, so I can create a new, uh, I, I could do the spreadsheet um, import, or I can create a particular class um, and then. Uh, if I click a particular class, once you've created it, it will list your students. And then basically, this will initially be blank once you, well, let's actually do it. So add class, um, test class, nine, um, year group, I don't know, year 10, uh, assign teachers, me, uh, schemes of work, I won't bother, submit. And then basically, it will explain all the options for adding students to your class. So you could just give them that link there. And if you accidentally close this, You've got the link here, registration URL. You give them that link, they will then be able to register and they can set their own password. Um, that will let anyone with that link be able to register for your class. But you can add the students yourself. So if you, if you know the class list, you can click add students, you put in their names, uh, you just copy and paste from a spreadsheet, it explains everything there in the text, I'm not gonna read it now. Um, and then if you click continue, it will then say, what do you wanna do with these students? So, uh, this student, Dave McBloke, is not my school, so it's going to create an account for him. Um, but Joe Bloggs, he's apparently already in the school, so I have the option to um, move him from that other class or even keep him in his old class and just add him to this class as well. Um, can you kick kids out? Of course you can. Uh, so if I go to a class and I click a student, I can uh, remove them from their class. I can even delete their account if you wish. Uh, and if students accidentally don't follow that link you gave them and register independently, you can find them in students with no class here. So these are students with no class and I can click them, I can then move their class. Obviously there's buttons for changing the password, but as I say, just, just play with it and most of the buttons are fairly intuitive what you do. How do you sign the same task to students who have joined the class after work was set? Basically, if you then go back to uh, set work, view homeworks, you'll see um, uh, for that homework, for that grid of homework you've set, the cell will be blank on the table for them, um, except we'll say assign this homework. And then you can click that and assign that existing task to the student, if that makes sense. Um, but you can ask me about that later. And I, I can demo that at the end of this because I'm running out of time. Um, yeah, right. The final things are the whiteboard and the live game. So whiteboard, you can access it with this icon here, the whiteboard there. Uh, or I can also go to, if you, you can click it, uh, access it from the dashboard here, DF and whiteboard or from the menu. So the whiteboard there. So let's go to it. Um, so I'm going to give you this link so you can connect to my whiteboard. So I'm just going to put it in the chat, uh, everyone in meeting. So if you go to this, click that, and then I hopefully will be able to see you. There are some kinks with this, and I gradually need to iron them out in terms of connectivity. Uh, but hopefully, if you see that, I can say, look, can you see this eye icon? So I can see all these people. If I click that, I can then see all the people who have connected to my whiteboard. Isn't that cool? So you can see all the hi. Uh, I'm going to see Chris is writing something. He's written hi back. Laura is writing hello. Um, now, what's quite cool is if I go back to the whiteboard again, 
Um, I, can Im, uh, I can select different types of grid, so isometric, if you like. Um, you can select different colors, et cetera. Uh, you can draw circles and arcs. Um, but what I want to do is I want to um, select a question. So if you go to this library thing here and then click it, uh, I can select a question. So if I just go to, you know, let's go to any old uh, an Excel question. Um, and then, so if I get this, then it should, that should appear on your whiteboard if it's worked. Hello, DFM heart shape. Oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> what is that? Um, by the way, you can write on specific students' whiteboards. So if I click interact with Paul, <laughs> that's Paul's lovely sketch. Um, and then I can write hi, Paul. And that will only appear on his whiteboard and not everyone's, which is quite cool. So if I go back, um, you can see it's only appeared on Paul's whiteboard. Um, he's even responded, thank you, Paul. Um, so that's quite cool. And what's cool is I can now annotate on that question and then you should all be able to see that. Um, so that's quite cool. Is, it, is that the only way to join via the link? Yes. Um, I think at the moment, if they're in your class, it actually automatically goes, to, they connect to your whiteboard. But I might be removing that because then it gets, if you have multiple classes you're teaching, then I'm teaching my year nine class, having just taught my year sevens. That means my year sevens in the previous class will then be able to see, connect to your whiteboard that you've just used when, yeah, anyway, um, I might be changing that. Um, if you can't see the exam question, yeah, there's some kinks, and I think it's based on certain people's network settings, and I need to get to the bottom of that, uh, but it seems to work with most of them. Can you save a copy of yours on student whiteboards? Not at the moment. I know you can see these links here, and you're probably wondering. That's for admins only because of something else we use this whiteboard for. Um, but actually, if you right-click and do, this is a browser thing, this is not specific to my site, and go to Save Image, you can save a, um, a PNG, a, a JPEG or whatever, of this. However, you can't export and import whiteboards at the moment. It doesn't save this data. Um, that's something maybe for the future. Uh, right, so that's the whiteboard. And the very final thing I'm going to do just in the, like literally five minutes um, and then we'll finish um, is the DFM Live. So you can access it if you go to Set Work Live Classroom Game or if I go to DFM Live on the, white, on the dashboard. And we want to do it by worksheet past paper. So if I just find a worksheet, let's do a foundation paper. So 9 to 1 foundation, I'm going to select uh, any on paper. Uh, let's do a more interesting first question. Uh, yeah, no, I'll do that. Okay, fine. Um, if I go to, can you see the live game button there? So if I click that, there's a few options. You can alert, um, require logins and then the students can't have nicknames or you can go to uh, guess allowed. So I'm going to do that so you can have nicknames. Uh, you can either say that they get more points so they're faster um, they always get at least get 500 points if they got the question right. They get up to 1,000 points if they're the first person going gradually down. Or I can have no speed bonus. They all get 1,000, they get it right. Um, and let's do, um, this is kind of lockdown mode. So usually the question only appears on the teacher's projector, but obviously that's not convenient at the moment because of lockdown. So you can actually say, I want them to see the question on their screen as well. So let's start the game very quickly. I'm conscious of time. Now, I'm gonna, if you go to that link, dotsrossmaths.com slash join, don't just go to the homepage expecting to be able to get to it, but I'm gonna post that link here. So if you go to that, click that link, and the passcode is 488908. Now, I should be able to see you as you join. Hello, SM, you're the first in. If you've got to go, it's definitely worth waiting for this because this is awesome. And we're literally finishing in two minutes. Oh, Adam Jones has potentially found a bug with the whiteboard. Um, I'm going to investigate that. Uh, I'll investigate that, Adam, don't worry. Someone said that the other day, actually. I didn't initially know what they meant, but I, I, I get it now. That might be a problem. Right, one more minute to get in and then we're starting. Right, 10. Yeah, you can mute the music if you, if you don't like it. So um, I know you like the music. Um, so if you click that, that thingy icon, you turn off the music. Uh, you can't join. Why is that, Chris? Uh, I... I'll, I'll try and resolve it later. Um, but it seems that most people will be able to get in. Right, 10. 
Nine. Well, eight. Yeah, I can join this. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Let's start. Here's the first question. You can zoom in. So there we go. SM in. Wow. 2.83 seconds. And by the way, I did this with about three, over 300 people the other day, and it worked perfectly. It works in bulk. So you could, you could have a whole year group assembly doing this, and um, it would work perfectly. It doesn't slow down at all. Oh, we're nearly there. And then click, uh, I'm just going to stop waiting. Apologies for being in. So SM, you were first. Um, so you got the most points. Carl was second, Helen, and then Emma. Well done, those guys. Just one more question, and then we'll finish. So this one, you get to drag them around, which is quite cool. So put your things in order of size. SM in first again. Yeah, sorry, Anderson. It seems if you left and then re-came in, you've, you've missed the whiteboard bit. But don't worry, I've recorded this. You'll be able to see it. Watch it later. Right, I, you've got five seconds to put that answer in. Four, three, two, one. Stop waiting. There we go. Uh, and let's see one. I'm going to fit. Obviously, I could go to the end of this paper, but I'm going to click finish. Uh, and now you should see on your screen, it should say, see, show your rank. So uh, SM should see first on this. Um, yeah, don't worry, Fleur. There's, um, uh, I'm sending a video of this later, so you'll be able to see that. Um, so well done, SM. You've won, and Carl was second. Uh, you can see the full results. So show full results. And then you can see in rank order. Um, Cool. Um, at the moment, you can't export this, but I will be considering that for the as a future facility. Um, Laura had a problem seeing the numbers. I'll look into that later on a screen. Um, cool. Right. That is the end of this presentation. I have uh, 10 minutes now to answer any questions that you have. You can either type them or, um, or say them. If you want to unmute yourself, that's absolutely fine. Um, can we have the videos of all the trainings? Yes. I'll send you tonight the video of... Um, the uh of today's one or, or tomorrow morning i'll send it to you um but there will also be a link to like the um all i'm going to basically make a web page where i have all the recordings of all of them but to be honest there's only there's a beginner intermediate event which this was and this is exactly the same as all the previous ones in fact you got the best one because you have the latest version of dfm and literally with even within the two weeks that i've been doing these events there's a bunch of new facilities that, that weren't there before um, but I also, I'll give you the link in the email I'll send you to the advanced one, which will show you, for example, uh, how to do a spreadsheet import um, for classes, how to set up a scheme of work, um, how to do a worksheet auto generator, that kind of stuff. So don't worry. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Um, I've got 10 minutes now to answer any questions you have. It feels like the end of an era because this is event nine of nine and I finally got to the end. <laughs> um, so um, I can relax a bit slightly. Right, anyway, questions. Uh, do you set most of your homeworks via DFM? Uh, if so, do you give feedback and satisfy your marking policy? Um, well, our marking policy at my school is slightly light. We basically take in their books um, eight for each class twice a half term. And then I'm mostly reviewing like presentation rather than um, like marking specific answers. The things they get so many tests out of school, like um, one every, half term or sick form is more than that that they get a lot of like we do a lot of marking with that but i mostly taking books to review for presentation i do admittedly set most of my homeworks on dfm and that's partly because i'm probably the busiest person on the planet um and it slightly alleviates my workload other staff generally set about 50 percent of their homework on um dfm at my school and the other half is sort of written homeworks um i hope that elucidates um jamie yep Right. I am relatively new at my school. I was been I was in FE for a very, very long time and yep. I just went back to secondary. Now I'm not sure, you know, how could I get my students on to this website? Because I'm not sure what are the limitations. Can I just go ahead without the school's knowledge and said, okay, I'm gonna be using this or this has to be something coming from the school. Um, I would just check with the school. Like, if you have a new big platform you're using, I think it's just a match procedure just to check with them. But there's, there's nothing, um, most teach, teachers would probably just kind of go to manage classes and then 
um, they would set up a class and give the student the link to that. And as I said, do watch that Get Help video, which explains everything to do with that. Um, and the, the thing is, I have a privacy policy and it's very detailed and I've gone through the mm -hmm. EU law to make sure I'm complying with that. Um, so on most web pages, you can see a privacy policy. And if you want to give that to your school to give them peace of mind um, about how mm -hmm. I use data and how I protect data, um, then you can do that. Um, some schools are, are stricter than others. So some schools will send me a long document I have to fill in about how I comply with X, Y, and Z. And I send it back and they're, they're, they're always happy. Um, and other schools, um, like as long as they, you know as a teacher that you're being safe with your students' data um, and that you know there's a privacy policy on my site, they're generally okay with that. So it depends on your school. I would just maybe consult with um, someone more senior uh, just to check if that's okay. All right, that's one question. Another quick question, <clears throat> please, and yep. then I will go. Now, I've got, you know, friends like living in the Caribbean. Would they be able to access? I noticed that when at the very beginning when you were showing all the examination boards and who have access, I didn't see anything from the Caribbean. So how would they be able to tap they, into your They resources? can still access it. It's just mm -hmm. there won't be questions specific to um, Caribbean examples. As I said, I'm trying to expand more internationally. But there's, like, we've literally we've got um, about a 1,000 schools registered from outside the UK. Um, and um, you, you, we don't, you can, you can, when you go to register, basically, you can type mm. in your school and um, if it's not there, there's then basically it says email this, um, email this person to add the school and you, you email support with the link you provided with and um, we can then add the school for you. So uh, that's not an issue. It's just there won't be questions specific to your country's example. Yes. Basically. All right. Then. It's something that you would consider, though, looking into the, the Caribbean papers. And oh, then yes, yeah. Um, as, as I say, I'm trying to expand more internationally. I need staff to do that. Um, so if I get the adequate funding to do that, then that, that's something I definitely intend to do. All right, I had a then. question before, like, can you add them for the Pacific, um, the Pacific Islands, um, which hmm. is quite cool. Um, so because the Pacific Islands will have a shared exam board. So could yes, I add yes, questions? Yeah, they all, yeah, so they I've, I've had all sorts of requests. Um, at the moment, um, someone's asking about Scottish exam board. At the SQA, I think there are some questions there um, on, on there. Um, but, uh, and the CCEA, which is the Northern Irish exam board, is what I'm working on at the moment. Uh, in fact, I need to get oh. back to them because they seem to provisionally said they were going to say yes, um, but I haven't heard from them in a week, so I need to chase them up. All right. Jamie. All right, then. Thank you. Thank no you for your help. Jamie's, oh, uh, Jamie's Bupinder here. I don't know, Jamie, can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? I can. Okay, Jamie, the two things. I actually teach Martin College or FE uh, College. And uh, we are actually being uh, got uh, Math Watch. But yeah. I like you, you. This one is better than Math Watch, which yeah, I, I got a more control. Yeah, so he is. Go on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would like to actually convince my students to bring it on here. Ah, so, now, I've got an answer to that. I mm -hmm. will send in the email tonight or tomorrow morning, I've got a nice little PowerPoint I've produced, which is information for uh, school inquirers. Um, mm -hmm. So if I've got it here, so, uh, oh, I'll find it in a second. It's not in my recently viewed thing. But there's a PowerPoint, which is per particularly for that purpose of convincing your school to move to DFM and mm -hmm. what it offers and just a summary of its functionality. Uh, if I bring my few classes, I don't bother about uh, math watch. Uh, is it free for them as well? Is it? It's completely free. The whole site is completely okay. free in its entirety. Okay, that's good. And other thing is, when I'm looking at my screen, the left hand side actually I cut off. It'd be. Oh, is that on the? It might be a thing, to, a Zoom problem. Okay. Um, but it will be in the video. If you watch the video later on YouTube, which I'll provide you the link to, then it mm -hmm. won't have cut off the left-hand side. Um, so a few people in past events have said that, and I haven't quite worked out Zoom enough to see, to find out why that is. Okay. And other thing is, uh, last question, uh, because uh, India has also got a few schools, because you didn't mention anything about India. In India is a very developing market for education side. Yeah. And uh, because on this sort of things are there, they're mostly the, they've got a few international schools and they do a GCSEs. And uh, if I tell somebody, they can be able to access it from India as well? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The only place that people have had trouble accessing some of it is from mainland China, but um, okay. <laughs> that's because of um, all their firewalls that they have. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I've even contacted the Chinese embassy before to discuss mm -hmm. that, but um, 
that, that it, it should be accessible everywhere. Okay, thanks very much for that, I mean, thank you. Perhaps okay. also not accessible in North Korea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Jimmy. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much. It's a fantastic and a brilliant resources with uh, the details and the very well explained. Um, can I ask, please, because we attended today, is, is there any possibility to send us email saying that we attend at least to add it to our CBD? Uh, oh, yeah, certificate or something. Um, I'll yeah, yeah, kind can, of certificate. I'll see if I can come up with, with I mean, something. For example, I'm working for FE and we had full day today for BDR. Yeah. And I have to cut my session to attend yours. Yeah. I, I and mean, then I have to leave early to attend yours. So is that possible? <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, I'll see if I can come up with something for that. Yeah. Yeah, Thank that you. would be great as well, because I'm trying to build a folder um, as well so I can get my QTA. So the more information I have there to say I did attend would be great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, Thank I'll try you. and do that. Thank you. And yeah, and I email the links and stuff. And I'll fantastic, you. fantastic. Thanks very much. Right, yeah. I've got time for one more question, then I have to go because I've got four hours of tutoring now. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what my life is like at the moment. Right, any final questions? One final question. Can you send out all the PowerPoint and the math watch, please? Uh, Mm, yeah. PowerPoint. Well, I haven't got anything on math. Although actually, um, in yeah. PowerPoint, I've got which is like information inquiries. It does compare yeah. the functionality of my platform versus Math Watch. Yeah. Maths, I'd be so. really grateful for that if you can send that. Yeah, yeah. I I was, was, don't worry. I'll definitely send that. It will be. And secondly, I also missed my other CPD to join this. Okay. So, so if Fine. you can send yeah. us something like that, I'd be really grateful. Do I have um, L two? I don't know what L two for math materials. Do you mean? Um, well, there's loads of server mass resources. I think level two for our functional skills. Oh, no, I, I don't. Um, okay. Sorry, I don't, I don't have resources on that at the moment. Sorry, I don't mean level two functional skills. I mean uh, level two further mathematics. Okay. Certificate. Oh, um, they're for AQA level two yeah. further mathematics. Yes. Um, yeah, I do. Um, perhaps not as easy to find as it should be. Um, if you go to... Uh, I don't, do I link to it individually? If I type, type in IGC further mass, um, go to resources. Uh, yeah, it's got loads of the slides um, here. So you can Brilliant. click IGC further mass domain and range, basically AQA okay, syllabus, you can click that and then download that resource. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, so I do, because we teach at my school. Cool. Um, right, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to go. Uh, if you have any further questions, just email uh, jamie at drfrostmass.com and I promise I will either send that email probably early tomorrow morning uh, when I've had the, bit, the opportunity to upload the video. Um, but thank you so much for coming. I'm very thank grateful. You. And this is the end. This is the end of event nine of nine. Um, and I can uh, sleep slightly more soundly. <laughs> but um, it's just been great. Just I've had literally thousands of teachers come to these. And I never imagined I'd be able to present to so many via uh, Zoom. So it's been fantastic. Cool. Thank you. So take care. So stop recording.